listeners, we want to tell you about a podcast we're really digging. It's called Christopher Kimball's Milk Street Radio. Every week, they travel the world to find the most fascinating stories about food, including children who harvest cod tongues after school in Norway and a detective who tracks down food thieves. And on Milk Street Radio, you can always find the unexpected. The comedian who ranks apples using an elaborate 100-point system, the secret history of grocery stores, and how to eat your way through Italy. They also interview the most beloved names in food like Jacques Pepin, Sola Aueli, Jose Andres, Jet Tila, Ina Garten, Nigella Lawson, and Padma Lakshmi. Plus, co-hosts Christopher Kimball and Sarah Moulton do live calls with listeners and answer their questions about ingredients, techniques, and culinary mysteries. Like, why roasting a leg of lamb made one caller's oven explode? Ever wonder why your bread won't rise or your souffle falls flat? Chris and Sarah have the answers. You'll also hear from a rotating cast of contributors, including Kenji Lopez-Alt, Cheryl Day, Dan Pashman from The Sporkful, and Alex Inews, a French guy cooking from YouTube. Take a listen at 177milkstreet.com slash radio, or just search your podcast app for Milk Street Radio. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. When I say the word celebration, what pops into your head? I bet you're thinking about birthday cakes, holiday parties, and big life events like graduations and weddings. But what would happen if we brought celebration into our everyday lives? Maybe it could be an incredibly useful tool for social change and sustainability. Today on Meet in 3, we are talking acknowledgement and celebration. And we're doing so by celebrating our own archive. Our reporters are looking back at some of their favorite stories from the HRN airwaves. I'm Taylor Early, and this is Meet and Three on HRN. Meet and Three. Meet and Three. Meet and Three. One meet, three sides. Food, news, and storytelling. A square meal for your ears. Meet and Three. Change is constant, and how we relate to it shapes the fabric of our lives. But that relationship is not passive. It takes conscious effort. For our first story, Elizabeth Fisher reflects on Lucy O'Hagan's teachings to ground ourselves against the uncertainties brought on by our ever-changing lives and planet. When thinking of the inescapable passage of time, I began to spiral. Day to day, there never seems to be enough to do all that I need or want to. On a larger scale, I find myself considering existential questions brought on by climate change. As an aspiring teacher, I'm most concerned about what the future holds for young people. But after hearing from guest Lucy O'Hagan on episode 36 of Dyed Green, I began to feel grounded and realistically hopeful. This is not work that will be achieved in one Mm. lifetime, you know, like this is multi-generational work and it's not new either. Lucy is a teacher, wildlife tracker, environmental activist, and the founder of Wild Awake. The program offers students in Ireland the opportunity to reconnect to Ireland's landscape and ancestral ways of life. Hosts Kate McCabe and Max Sussman interview Lucy about the importance of learning from the past in order to inform us of our role in the present which will inevitably shape the future. And what a lot of us are doing now is yeah, looking to those old ways to inform us about how we can approach the very real challenges that we're facing today. Through Wild Awake, students participate in journeys inspired by the idea of rewilding or relearning traditional skills in nature, such as foraging and using stone tools. Students are also introduced to interpersonal skills, like conflict resolution. Throughout the program, young learners engage in rites of passage, like keeping a fire alive from sunset to sunrise. These rituals mark important transitions that may have otherwise been ignored, especially as many societies become increasingly secular. There are so many people who are turning away from the church now, and it's a very difficult thing because in the absence of community that's provided by some church, it's very difficult to know what what is it that we're stepping into like how is it that we mark these important transitions in our lives and celebrate them i was raised catholic but distanced myself from the church as a teenager in doing so i never considered that i would be sacrificing moments in my young life that should have been centered and celebrated lucy's project offers young people a chance to integrate important changes into their lives 
with the intention of benefiting the greater community and culture. How do we make sure that this experience doesn't just drift off in our memory, but how do we really make sure that it lands in a person so that they're able to really bring it into their lives and allow it to ripple out into their communities in in positive ways. Educators today are responsible for giving young people the skills and opportunities to understand their place in our changing world, as well as strengthening a very specific muscle. Hope is a muscle. Something that I really try to push in my work is like the responsibility of this knowledge of this life. But this responsibility didn't begin with our generation and won't end with it. The work towards a better world, a safer and healthier environment, and equipped young learners is continuous and perpetual. People migrate for many reasons, some voluntary and others not so much. These various diaspora have a distinct and lasting impact on food cultures. This is particularly noticeable within marginalized communities such as Native Americans, or in this case, Spain's Gitano population. Addison Austin Liu has the story. Adaptation to new environments, available resources, and even day-to-day safety are all factors that sculpt foodways. The Gitano, also known as Roma or Romani, arrived in Spain in 1425. They are a historically migratory and heavily persecuted community and a unique example of culinary development. What makes them unique is that they've never really identified uh, with having kind of like a home territory, and they claim no tradition of an ancient or distant homeland. That was Valerio Ferris, a food historian interviewed by Linda Palaccio for an episode of A Taste of the Past in 2021. He spent time cooking with and interviewing Gitano around Barcelona. His goal was to collect recipes and record their culinary legacy. They became kind of scapegoats depending on where they live for a variety of societal ills. Um, and their relationships with host countries were marked by a lot of contradictions. With this history of poverty, subjugation, mobility, how was that also affecting their shared food culture? Roma were the second most targeted group during the Holocaust, with an estimated 400,000 murdered. Despite this, the Hitano and their counterparts have persevered to develop pockets of vibrant community worldwide. A phrase in Hitano communities They say, what a Gitano dish, when they taste it, because it has such an intense flavor of fennel. Alongside fennel, chicken, pork, and legumes are staples of Gitano cuisine. This is due to their affordability, versatility, and relative ease of transport. These ingredients are often utilized in pojates, or stews, eaten directly out of large pots, shared among many. And they say, um, cucharra y paso atrás, which means take a spoon, and pass it on. Hitano culinary tradition is passed down matrilineally through the oldest daughter. In contemporary society, these traditions are at risk of skipping generations or disappearing entirely. But there are still those dedicated to keeping it alive. One such woman Ferris interviewed, Paquita Domingo, summarizes it perfectly. My culture is very based on food. It's super important. If we don't conserve it, I would lose my identity. It's our way of understanding the world. It's our love. It's our dedication to our elders. If we promote our culture, we become more visible. Protecting foodways secures legacy. For the Hitano, food is their ancestral homeland. To pass the spoon is to bring them home. We'll be right back with more Meat and 3 after a brief break. Welcome back to Meet and 3. Vintage cocktail books are more than just a repository of recipes. They're a snapshot of another era. Up next, Jessica Gingrich stirs up a story that revels in the quirks these books contain. She reminds us that history is not just written in textbooks. It's shaken, stirred, and poured into the drinks we share and the stories we tell. Here's to the girl who's strictly in it who never loses her head even for a minute, plays well the game and knows her limit, and still she gets the fun there's in it. That's Dr. Nicola Nice, the founder of Pomp and Whimsy Gin Company, reading her favorite toast from a book published in 1908. Dr. Nice has spent years collecting and archiving antique books on alcohol and drinks written by women, which are incredibly rare and difficult to find. 
Book by book, she's pieced together the forgotten role of women in cocktail history. On a 2021 episode of A Taste of the Past, Dr. Nice shared some of her favorite titles and the details in them that bring this history to life. Backers Behave is one of my favorite cocktail books. And one of the things that I first noticed about my copy when I got it was the front cover had very faint what appeared to be scribbles on it. And what this told me was that this was a book that was owned by a mother. And it was a book that most likely, because it was used regularly, was probably kept out. Uh, Perhaps it was kept on a bar, but it was picked up by tiny fingers as a result at some point and drawn on. The stains, the scribbles, and the occasional child's drawing nestled between the pages. These are the signs of life, the personal touches that reach across generations and give each book their unique story. And indeed, this happened to me, where my daughter, who was three at the time, got hold of my copy of Backers Behave because my copy was also out, as it was something I referred to fairly regularly. And yes, let's just say she added her own notation. Discovering these details is part of the joy of paging through vintage cocktail books. The signs of wear and tear, blots of spilled spirits and handwritten notes tucked into the margins are not just mere imperfections. They're what gives the book value, not in monetary terms, but in their ability to uncover the stories that traditional historical accounts have overlooked. And that is something to raise your glass to. Cheers to that. (laughs) Restaurants are often the stage for people to celebrate special occasions. But if you've ever worked in hospitality like I have, you might have also just had a chill run up your spine or rolled your eyes at the huge production it takes to make these celebrations for other folks possible and rarely getting properly compensated. And on top of these stressful shifts, the regular plagues of the food service industry, getting paid well below minimum wage, offered no benefits, and even requiring you to work in unsafe conditions. Would you quit? Or would you stay to fix those problems? For our next story, Hannah Shenard looks into the Gastronomica archives to hear from Chef Malcolm James Mitchell. He discusses the Great Resignation and the battle to reform food service. Imagine yourself at a restaurant. As you sit back in your chair, you hear the clinking of silverware and the din of conversation all around you. What about the people bussing your table? How much do they get paid? Do they have insurance? Paid time off? What are the working conditions like for the people who serve you dinner? We want livable wages. You know, we want better conditions in the hospitality industry. Chef, author, and Food Network star Malcolm James Mitchell is dedicated to using his platform to call out inequities in food service and to help make the industry a better place to work. If I can only help myself and I cannot help others, I'm not helping anything. For those in the know, food service is a notoriously flawed industry. Sexual harassment, abuse, wage theft, unpaid labor, and racism are common workplace hazards. Over 10 years working in restaurants as a prep cook, server, busser, and maitre d', my relationship with the industry is complicated. Like Chef Mitchell, I found my home in food service. I love the industry, but I've never really felt safe there. Almost every employer has stolen wages from me. I've been sexually harassed in almost every restaurant I've worked in and have been screamed at or severely disrespected by most of my chefs and managers. My experience is not at all unique. That's probably part of the reason why an estimated 2.5 million people have left food service in the last four years. While many people see the Great Resignation as a loss for the industry, Chef Mitchell sees this exodus as an opportunity. We're dealing with the people that really, really want to strive and really hold this industry um, dear to their heart. And they want to see that this industry progresses in a way we can still keep this industry alive. And so for me... It's a, it's a resurrection of the industry, what we're going through now. As Chef Mitchell sees it, the industry can only be changed when people are willing to be there in the system fighting for their rights. You stay and you fight, 
right? You don't quit. You stay and you fight. If you want change, you fight for what you believe in. I don't want to resign from this industry. I love this industry. I'm going to fight for the industry. I'm going to fight for the people in this industry. And that's my ultimate goal. The dedication of people like Chef Mitchell is paying off, slowly but surely. Restaurant union drives are popping up all over the country, and seven states and counting have passed legislation to raise worker wages. Things are getting better, but the fight's not over yet. That's our show. Thanks for listening. Learn more about the guests and topics we touched on this week by checking out our show notes. This episode of Meet and 3 was reported by Elizabeth Fisher, Addison Austin Liu, Jessica Gingrich, and Hannah Chenard. Meet and 3 is produced by H. Conley and me, Taylor Early. Our audio engineer for this episode was Armin Spengen. Our theme song was composed by Breakmaster Cylinder. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Meet and 3 is powered by Simplecast. Meet and 3 is a production of Heritage Radio Network, the world's pioneer food radio station. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org and follow us at heritage underscore radio. And please stay in touch. Whether you have a story idea or just like to say hey, write us at ideas at meetin3.nyc. And that's all spelled out.